This is Stephen Todman, pediatric cardiologist at LSU in Shreveport, and today we'll be talking about pediatric syncope. We're going to follow the ABP content outline specifications. So for syncope, we are required to uh, plan the appropriate evaluation of a syncopal or presyncopal episode, including episodes associated with exercise, and recognize the cardiac causes of syncope. Uh, Ray Lewis uh, is a is a very motivational. Um, sports figure, and he has a quote. Um, it's actually uh, the five P's. So he says, proper preparation prevents poor performance. So hopefully by the end of this lecture, you will be adequately prepared to master this content outline. So let's talk about the prevalence. Uh, as many as 15% of children uh, and adolescents are gonna have a syncopal episode between the ages of eight and 18 years of age. Before age six, uh, syncope is unusual, except in the setting of seizure disorders, breath holding, and cardiac arrhythmias. As far as the definitions are concerned, we're gonna talk about syncope, presyncope, and dizziness. So, so what is syncope? Syncope is basically a transient loss of consciousness and muscle tone that results from inadequate cerebral perfusion. Presyncope is the feeling that, you, that the feeling like uh, you're gonna you're gonna pass out, but you ultimately remain conscious and have a transient loss of postural tone. Dizziness is a nonspecific symptom that can include vertigo, lightheadedness. The patient may say, uh, my, my head is spinning or the room is whirling to describe vertigo. Uh, it, and that's a manifestation of, of, vestibular, of a vestibular disorder. Lightheadedness often accompanies hyperventilation and is frequently associated with psychological distress like anxiety, uh, depression, or panic attacks. So what are the causes of syncope? They can be uh, broadly defined as non-cardiac and, car and cardiac. So to take it a, a step backwards, the normal function of the brain uh, depend on, depends on a constant supply of oxygen and glucose. And significant changes in the supply of oxygen and glucose can result in syncope, presyncope, or dizziness. And the differential diagnosis of syncope is huge. It can be due to non-cardiac causes like autonom autonomic dysfunction, cardiac conditions like neuropsychiatric conditions, and metabolic disorders. Disorders. Now, opposed, as opposed to adults in whom syncope is often cardiac, in children and adolescents, most syncope is thankfully benign. Benign childhood syncope results from, uh, from vasovagal episodes most commonly, but it can also be due to orthostatic intolerance, dehydration or inadequate hydration, hyperventilation, and breath holding. For the pediatric provider, the primary purpose of the evaluation of patients with syncope is to determine whether the patient is at increased risk for death. So in this video, uh, I'm only going to discuss the circulatory causes of syncope, and uh, you can, you're, you're welcome for that. <laughs> I won't be discussing the metabolic and neuropsychiatric causes of syncope in this video. So turning towards the non-cardiac causes of syncope, uh, the primary category here is orthostatic intolerance. Orthostatic intolerance comes from an abnormal blood flow, heart rate, and blood pressure regulation that are most easily demonstrable um, during orthostatic stress. Three easily defined types of orthostatic intolerance are vasovagal syncope, orthostatic hypotension, and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, also known as POTS. So turning towards vasovagal syncope or neurocardiogenic syncope, uh, we should know that it's the, the most common type of syncope in otherwise healthy children. It's uncommon prior to 10 to 12 years of age, but very prevalent in adolescent girls. If I had to write a, a textbook vignette, it would be a 14-year-old female. And I see uh, a number of patients every week with vasovagal syncope. Vasovagal syncope is characterized by a prodrome of up to one minute, and this prodrome can include dizziness, nausea, pallor, diaphoresis, palpitations, blurred vision, headache, or, or hyperventilation. The prodrome is followed by a, a loss of consciousness and muscle tone. The patient usually falls without injury, but the unconsciousness doesn't last more than one minute, and the patient gradually awakens. 
uh, vasovagal syncope can occur after getting up in the morning or, or after taking a hot morning shower. Vasovagal syncope can be associated with prolonged standing, anxiety, fright, pain, a blood draw, or the, or the sight of blood, fasting, hot and humid conditions, uh, or crowded places. Syncope can also occur after a prolonged exercise if it stops suddenly. The pathophysiology of vasovagal syncope isn't completely understood, but it's, it always occurs while the patient is sta in a standing position. Hypovolemia is a predisposing factor, and the pharmacologic approach to prevent vasovagal syncope uh, includes alpha-adrenergic agonists, beta blockers, SSRIs, anticholinergic muscarinic blockers, and volume expansion. So uh, here's a pearl. Whenever you see a huge laundry list of medications for a disease, it's a red flag that none of them really work very well. So that's definitely the case here. But my personal go-to drug is midodrine. Now, history is the most important in, in establishing the diagnosis of vasovagal syncope. If the patient uh, feels like they're about to faint, they should be told to lie down with the feet raised above the chest, and this usually aborts the syncope. So next is orthostatic hypotension. So in contrast to the prodrome seen with vasovagal syncope and orthostatic hypotension, patients experience only lightheadedness. Orthostatic hypotension is usually related to medication or dehydration, but it can be precipitated by prolonged bed rest, prolonged standing, and conditions that decrease the circulating blood volume, uh, like bleeding and dehydration. Drugs that interfere with the sympathetic vasomotor response, uh, like calcium channel blockers, antihypertensive drugs, vasodilators, uh, phenothiazines, and diuretics can, uh, uh, can exacerbate orthostatic hypotension. Dysautonomia uh, can, may also be seen during acute infectious disease or peripheral neuropathies like uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, in patients suspected of having orthostatic hypotension, uh, BP should be monitored in the supine and standing positions. And orthostatic hypotension, as defined by the American Autonomic Society, is a persistent fall in systolic or diastolic blood pressure of more than 20 over 10 uh, millimeters of mercury within three minutes of assuming the upright position without moving the arms or legs with no increase in the heart rate but without fainting. Orthostatic hypotension uh, might only be demonstrable in the presence of dehydration, and that's important to know. So patients with orthostatic hypotension uh, don't display the autonomic nervous system signs of vasovagal syncope like pallor, diaphoresis, and hypo hyperventilation. The same management that's given for vasovagal syncope is sometimes successful here, and that could be elastic stockings, a higher salt diet, getting up slowly, counterpressure techniques, avoiding hot showers in the morning, and avoiding caffeine. So another uh, type of orthostatic intolerance is POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Uh, so patient with POTS uh, experience difficulties with daily routines like housework, shopping, eating, attending work or school, and, often, uh, and they often complain about chronic fatigue. Uh, I'm betting that, uh, that you're wondering if you have POTS syndrome right now. Uh, you, you probably don't though. So patients with POTS often have symptoms of syncope, dizziness, chest discomfort or pain, uh, headache, palpitations, nausea, fatigue, and exercise intolerance. POTS may be related uh, to chronic fatigue syndrome and it may be misdiagnosed as panic attacks or chronic anxiety. So, so to make the diagnosis of POTS, uh, heart rate and blood pressure monitor, are monitored in the supine um, sitting and standing position. And POTS is defined as the development of orthostatic symptoms that are associated with at least a 30 beat per minute increase in heart rate or a heart rate of greater than 120 beats per minute that occurs within the first 10 minutes of standing. An exaggerated increase in heart rate is often accompanied by hypot uh, hypotension in association with the symptoms that I just described. Uh, occasionally, patients develop swelling of the dependent lower extremities with a purplish discoloration of the dorsum of the foot and ankle uh, that you can see in the slide. The same approaches of management uh, of uh, the, the same approaches of management as vasovagal syncope are used with varying levels of success. So you should check if any medications the patient may be taking could be contributing to the problem, like vasodilators, TCAs, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or alcohol. The patient's advised to avoid extreme heat and dehydration, and to increase salt and fluid intake. 
pharmacologic agents like fludrocortisone, midodrine, uh, which we talked about before and is a peripheral vasoconstrictor, uh, uh, or venlafaxine, are useful in many patients. So what are some rare causes of syncope? Uh, the first one is micturation syncope, and it's a rare form of orthostatic hypo hypotension. Uh, in this condition, rapid bladder decompression results in uh, decreased total peripheral vascular resistance with splanchnic stasis and reduced venous return to the heart, and that results in postural hypotension. Another rare cause is uh, cough syncope, and that occurs after paroxysmal nocturnal coughing in children with asthma. The patient's face becomes plethoric um, and cyanotic. The, the child perspires, uh, becomes agitated, and is frightened. Loss of consciousness is associated with muscle contractions lasting for several seconds. Urinary incontinence is frequent. Uh, consciousness is ultimately regained within a few minutes. Treatment is aimed at preventing bronchoconstriction with aggressive asthma action plans. So let's talk about cardiac causes. Uh, cardiac causes of syncope uh, can include obstructive lesions, myocardial dysfunction, uh, and arrhythmias like long QT and Brugada syndrome. Uh, a cardiac cause of syncope is more likely when syncope occurs even in the recumbent position, uh, when it's provoked by exercise, uh, when the chest pain is associated with syncope, um, when, when there's a history of uh, unoperated or operated heart disease, or when there's a family history of sudden death. So patients with severe obstructive lesions like aortic stenosis, uh, pulmonary stenosis, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, uh, as well as patients with pulmonary hypertension may have syncope. And one co uh, commonality to these obstructive causes of syncope is that exercise often precipitates the syncope. Patients might also complain of chest pain, dyspnea, and palpitations. Myocardial dysfunction is another cardiac cause, and although rare, uh, myocardial ischemia or infarction, secondary congenital anomalies uh, of the coronary arteries can cause syncope. Example of this are uh, Kawasaki's disease or, or uh, atherosclerotic heart disease. Patients with dilated cardiomyopathy can have episodes of syncope associated with self-terminating episodes of ventricular tachycardia, which can lead to cardiac arrest. Syncope is a, is a major risk factor for subsequent sudden cardiac death and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, particularly if it's repetitive and occurs with exertion. Arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia often results in ventricular tachycardia caused by myocyte replacement by adipose tissue or fibrosis. So either extreme tachycardia or bradycardia can decrease cardiac output and lower the cerebral blood flow below the critical level causing syncope. So I mentioned before that uh, that when syncope occurs in the sitting or recumbent position, you have to think of a cardiac arrhythmia or, or a seizure as the cause. Uh, commonly encountered rhythm disturbances include SVT, VTAC, sick sinus syndrome, and complete heart block. Uh, simple bradycardia is usually well tolerated in children, but the combination of tachycardia followed by bradycardia is more likely to produce syncope. Uh, arrhythmias may or may not be associated with structural heart disease. So let's look at um, when there is no identifiable structural defects. So syncope from arrhythmias in children with, long, with, uh, with structurally normal hearts can be seen in long QT, short QT, WPW, RV dysplasia, and Brugada. And we see a picture of Brugada below. Uh, long QT is characterized by syncope caused by ventricular arrhythmias, prolongation of the QT interval on the EKG, and occasionally a family history of sudden death. Congenital deafness is also, also a component of Javel and Lang-Nielsen syndrome, but not of Romano Ward. Wolf-Parkinson-White uh, can also cause SVT. Um, RV dysplasia or RV cardiomyopathy is a rare anomaly of the myocardium, and that's associated with repeated episodes of ventricular tachycardia. Brugada syndrome uh, is a very rare cause of sudden death by ventri ventricular arrhythmias, and it's seen most commonly in Southeast Asian men. Syncope typically occurs at rest about 90% of the time. Uh, the EKG typically shows a right bundle branch block with J-point elevation and a concavity of ST uh, elevation in V1, and you can see that here. 
What about structural heart defects? So the, the following congenital acquired conditions, operated or unoperated, are associated with arrhythmias that may result in syncope. Uh, there's uh, Epstein's anomaly, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries. Um, all of those can cause arrhythmias. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, post-operative congenital heart diseases. Um, they can also ca uh, cause arrhythmias, especially after repairs of uh, tetralogy of Fallot, transposition of the great arteries, and after the Fontan operation. Uh, these children can have sinus node dysfunction, which is another another name for that is sick sinus syndrome. They can have SVT or VTAC or, or complete heart block. The third point is uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, and that can cause sinus bradycardia, SVT, or VTAC. And the last uh, of the structural heart diseases would be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that's a rare cause of ventricular tachycardia and syncope. So let's talk about the evaluation of a child with syncope. Most children who present with presyncope or syncope uh, have vasovagal phenomenon or another benign cause of syncope. The primary goal for the practitioner is to identify high-risk patients with underlying heart disease, and this can include EKG anomalies like uh, long QT, Wolf-Parkinson-White and Brugada, uh, cardiomyopathy, or structural heart diseases. And you should also be aware that the evaluation of pediatric patients with syncope should extend to other family members when a genetic condition is uh, suspected or identified. So let's turn to the history. Because physical exams of patients are almost always normal long after the event, accurate history taking is most important in, a, in determining a cost-effective diagnostic workup for each. You don't mind just throw a lot of tests at people. So the following are some important aspects of history taking that you, that you, uh, you want to hit. The first is about the syncopal event. Um, so, so you want to ask about the time of day. Uh, syncope occurring after rising in the morning or after a morning shower suggests vasovagal syncope. Hypoglycemia is a very rare cause of syncope occurring in a, in, in a fasting state in the morning. The patient's position, whether it's supine, standing, or sitting, is also important to know. So syncope while sitting or recumbent suggests arrhythmias or seizures. Syncope after standing for some time suggests orthostatic intolerance, like a vasovagal syncope. So the next thing you want to touch on is the relationship to exercise. Syncope occurring during exercise suggests arrhythmias. Uh, syncope occurring immediately after the cessation of physical activity suggests venous pooling in the legs uh, with reduced uh, venous return uh, and cardiac output. Estimating vigorousness and duration of the activity, uh, relative hydration status, and ambient temperature is important at the, at the time of the syncope as well. Uh, associated symptoms sometimes are helpful in, in, in uh, suspecting the cause of syncope. Uh, so palp palpitations or racing heart rate suggests tachycardia or arrhythmia. Um, uh, chest pain suggests uh, possible myocardial ischemia like obstructive lesions, cardiomyopathy or carditis. Uh, shortness of breath or tingling or numbness of the extremities suggests hyperventilation. Nausea, epigastric discomfort, and diaphoresis suggest vasovagal syncope. Uh, headaches or vision changes suggest vasovagal syncope. Uh, so I also want to look at the duration of the syncope. Uh, syncopal duration less than one minute suggests vasovagal syncope, postural hypoten uh, hypotension, or hyperventilation. Uh, a longer duration of syncope suggests convulsive disorders, migraines, or arrhythmias. The patient's appearance during, uh, during and immediately after the episode is important to know about. So uh, pallor indicates hypotension, abnormal movement or, uh, or posturing, confusion, focal neurologic signs, amnesia, or muscle soreness suggest the possibility of a seizure. Uh, history of a cardiac, endocrine, neurologic, or psychological disorder can suggest a disorder in that symptom in that system. Uh, medication history is important, uh, including uh, prescribed, over-the-counter, and recreational drugs. Uh, all of those things are, are are important to inquire about. So what about family history? Uh, you want to ask about coronary heart disease risk factors, including a history of uh, myocardial infarction and family members younger than 30, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, congenital heart disease, 
uh, cardiomyopathies, long QT, seizures, metabolic and so, uh, psychologic disorders are important, are important to know about. Uh, and a positive family history of fainting is common in patients with vasovagal syncope. So there, you, you're often going to um, hear uh, once you're counseling patients with vasovagal syncope, the the mom might say, "Oh, I have that too," or, or you know, "My aunt has that too. My 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 mother has that too." So it, they they usually go together. Social history is important in, in, a, in assessing whether there's a possibility of substance abuse, pregnancy, or, or factors leading to a conversion reaction. Now let's turn to the physical exam. Um, although the, the results of the physical exam are usually normal, a complete physical exam should always be performed, focusing on the patient's cardiac and neurologic status. If orthostatic intolerance is suspected, the heart rate and blood pressure should be measured repeatedly while the patient is supine and, and after standing without moving for up to uh, 10 minutes. Uh, in uh, in in a well hydrated state, positive uh, test results for vasovagal syncope or, or postural hypo, hypotension in the office setting are uncommon. Careful auscultation is also carried out to uh, detect a heart murmur or an abnormally loud second heart sound. And neurologic exam should include a fundoscopic exam, a test for Romberg sign, a gait evaluation, testing their deep tendon reflexes, and testing cerebellar function. Now let's uh, go to diagnost diagnostic studies. Now history and physicals guide practitioners in choosing the diagnostic tests that apply to a given patient with syncope. So like I said before, you know, you're not just throwing uh, the same tests uh, out of everybody. You want to um, use them judiciously based on uh, based on your history and physical exams. So diagnostic studies could include serum glucose and electrolytes, um, but there that's really of, of fairly limited value because the patients are seen hours or days after the episode. Uh, in, in suspected cases of arrhythmia, um, you, can, uh, you can order an EKG, ambulatory EKG monitoring, um, exercise stress test, echoes, uh, or consult neurology, uh, tilt table testing, but we'll go over each. So EKGs. All patients presenting with syncope should have an EKG. The EKG should be inspected for heart rate, so make sure there's no significant bradycardia, looking at arrhythmias, WPW, heart block, long QT, uh, as well as abnormalities suggestive of cardiomyopathies and myocarditis. Uh, ambulatory EKG monitoring is another one, another uh, test to consider. A correlation between the patient's symptoms and a diagnostic arrhythmia confirms the, the uh, arrhythmic cause of syncope. Symptoms without arrhythmia probably exclude an arrhythmic cause of syncope. A Holter monitor usually records EKGs for up to 24 hours. A loop recorder or, or event recorder uh, can, can, have, uh, can hold um, data for about a month and that usually increases the diagnostic yield. A non-looping event recorder can be used for symptomatic, uh, uh, well, really for symptoms lasting for a few minutes, uh, usually for a total time of about a month. Uh, an implantable loop recorder that can be uh, implanted in the left pectoral region is a device that, that can be used to record EKGs for a period much longer than a month. Uh, exercise stress test is another option. If the syncopal episode is associated with exercise, a treadmill uh, stress test should be performed with an EKG and bl blood pressure monitoring. Uh, echocardiograms identify structural abnormalities that can, that can be a cause of syncope and chest pain. Uh, identifiable structures are uh, severe obstructive lesions like aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, pulmonary hypertension, uh, certain congenital heart diseases like Epstein's mitral stenosis or regurgitation, L transposition, and also the status of uh, postoperative congenital heart diseases like tetralogy, transposition, and Fontan. The neurologic uh, consultation uh, can also be important. Uh, you uh, basically patients exhibiting prolonged loss of consciousness, seizure activity, and a postictal phase with lethargy or confusion should be referred for a neurologic consultation EEG. In the absence of this type of history, uh, the positive yield of EEGs or imaging studies are actually very low. Uh, and uh, t uh, tilt table testing virtually is never done uh, due to the high false positive rate. So that, that's all I have to say about tilt table testing. 
So let's talk about the treatment. Uh, patients with primary cardiac arrhythmias presenting as syncopal events can require antiarrhythmic medications. Fortunately, most arrhythmias respond to antiarrhythmic therapy. Patients with long QT are treated with beta blockers, pacemakers, or implantable cardio cardioverter defibrillators. And occasionally, catheter ablation can be indicated in some patients, like in patients with WPW uh, causing frequent SVT. Uh, treatment for orthostatic intolerance syndromes like vasovagal syncope. Let's let's talk about that. Um, so the the most important thing you can do is have them drink more. So you want to maintain adequate intravascular volume uh, up to three to four liters of water. I pretty much tell them that they are always going to be with their their water bottle. Uh, you know wherever their water bottle is, they will be, and wherever their water bottle where they are, their water bottle will be. They'll they'll be drinking all the time or or peeing uh, or or, or theoretically both at the same time. So they're always going to be drinking. That's the most important thing, um, far more important than than drugs. Um, about 99% of the case, we can uh, solve their problem uh, with, uh, with you know, without medications, just these behavior therapies. So drinking is the most important. Also, physical counter pressure, like tensing of the arms with clenched fists, leg pumping, leg crossing, those can abort syncopal episodes or at least delay it long enough that the patients can assume the supine position. Um, it's intended to reduce lower extremity venous pooling and therefore improve cardiac output and prevent vasovagal syncope. Uh, other things you can do, leg crossing with simultaneous tensing of the leg, uh, abs, um, buttock muscles, hand grip on a rubber ball. Um, arm tensing uh, involves gripping one hand uh, with the other while simultaneously abducting both arms. Another important thing is liberal use of salt. I usually, it's not uh, the most helpful thing, but it helps a little bit. Um, I tell them to, you know, you know, salt one meal or, um, or add a bag of pretzels to you know one per day, uh, you know one one bet one small bag per day. Um, that can help as well because um, we know that water follows salt. Um, uh, water follows salt, so if you have a little bit of extra uh, salt in your bloodstream, that can help uh, pump your intravascular volume up. You want to avoid caffeinated beverages and alcohol um, because of the di diuretic effect. You can do waist-high elastic support hose um, if patients, in some patients with postural hypotension. And like I said before, the drug that I use is Midodrine. It's a peripheral selective alpha-1 adrenergic agonist. Well, thank you very much for your attention and best of luck on your exams. Well, thank you very much for your attention and best of luck on your exams.